Our discussion of feminist analysis in a previous video mentioned how we've gone from a very simple view of sex and gender, meaning either male or female, and that's it. And we added in this, we took this huge leap to embrace androgyny, which is, you know, masculine personalities embracing some feminine um, perspectives and, and vice versa, right? That was a huge leap, right? And eventually we even came to the understanding that you know, women have as much value in society as men do, right? Go figure. This led to the development of what we called uh, feminist analysis from a critical perspective. Right? And that process uh, was really rapid. It only took about 200 years to unfold here in the United States for us to come to that understanding that, you know, men, women hold the same value as men in our society. Really, though, in a relatively short period of time since then, we've come to recognize that uh, the differences in sex and gender really exist on a spectrum that is much wider than just male or female, masculine or feminine, right? And as such, a new critical lens is needed to examine the role of media in advancing, deterring, and framing this evolving perspective of sex and sexuality. So with that, we are going to take a look at what is known as queer analysis, which does just that. It broadens our definition and our exploration of the impact of media on these things. Now, uh, note that our purpose here, as I talked about in feminist analysis, is not to debate the politics or the, the, the personal um, truth of whether or not this contemporary view of sex and gender is correct or right, but rather to consider the impact that those views have on media. Okay? As Aristotle pointed out, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So, we're not asking you to accept that this is true, that this is right, that this is the way things should be. We're just saying that this is a construct through which we need to examine media, be aware of this and have this tool in our tool belt. So whether or not you personally subscribe to this view of sex and sexuality is less important than that we be able to use this as a critical perspective. Okay, so let's Look at queer analysis, which is uh, just uh, queer analysis ex examines artifacts using a framework that considers how human understanding of gender, sex, and sexuality are affected by media. It's as simple as that. How do these things affect the way that we that we uh, create media, the way that we view media, the way that we use media, and all of those types of things? So let's take a quick look at the history of these things. First of all, uh, queer analysis is really an offshoot of feminist analysis. So it stems from and came out of feminist analysis. Once we started looking at, you know, we need to examine the world from a sense of you know, masculine and feminine, how that's impacted by the media. Then as we started to, to broaden our understanding of or thoughts about what may be involved in gender, then it made sense to develop something as a result of that, then looked at things more broadly than just masculine or feminine and looked at it in broader ways. So that's what queer analysis does. It focuses on those in-betweens, the in-betweens and the outside ofs and those types of things that exist near and next to and around masculine versus feminine, but it's much less binary than the feminist criticism. Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about. This is not a binary approach as in masculine or feminine or something in between those things or, you know, some combination of those things, but something that exists near and around but outside of those two categorizations. So the major premises of queer analysis are, first of all, that a binary view of sexuality is too narrow, as I was just saying, that uh, that this idea of either masculine or feminine is too narrow, and we need to think about things that exist outside of just those two things or some combination of those two things. And that the definition of these concepts and terms is constantly changing within a culture, which also defies attempts at binary classification. So first of all, our culture is constantly evolving, constantly changing. Things are are uh, are coming to light. Things are, are new. Old things are coming back again. Um, so our culture is constantly changing in every way all the time, right? And our culture also really does not like binary things. We like to, to use that for the sake of argument to try and um, you know make our arguments stand out as it's either A or B, option A or option B, and those are the only two possibilities. But the reality is we live in a complicated, complex world where almost Everything has more than just two possibilities. So including these things. So and so queer analysis really says that that is true in sexuality, just like it is 
anywhere else in our culture, in our society, and in the world. So we need to uh, look at media in more than just a in more than just terms of masculine or feminine. In a contemporary sense, uh, from a contemporary perspective, this starts by looking at things like sexual stereotypes. So we have lots of sexual stereotypes, including things like, well, sex is either natural or deviant, depending on your view. And well, you know, some sex is natural, other sex types of sex is, are deviant. And so we, that's really a binary approach. And there are lots of things in between there. Monogamous or promiscuous, you're either one or the other, and one is right, one is wrong, depending on your perspective. And uh, and the truth is, there's lots of things. First of all, again, outside of those two th two options, there's more than just those two options. But even within those two, there's some debate about and some room for exploration in terms of what's right, what's wrong. I mean, it's you know, it's culturally defined, and gender clarity versus gender ambiguity in terms of you know. It, it, does someone have to be either masculine or feminine or something close to that? Or is there some fluidity there? Uh, there's there's views that say, you know, each of those things. But the truth is, again, those are those are binary approaches. We need to get away from those binary perspectives and, and try not to think about things within those sexual stereotypes. Uh, then we also need to look at things like positive representation and the different types of positive representation that are out there, quote unquote, positive rep representation. And again, are they actually positive representation or not? Uh, it, it depends on your perspective, right? So there have been some attempts to really kind of um, bring positive representation in what we would consider positive representation. For example, Modern Family was a very popular television show for a long time. Uh, lots and lots of viewers uh, featured, of course, a gay couple, a gay, uh, you know, that had a gay family as part of that extended family. And uh, so it had uh, two gay men on the show. That uh, that really lived kind of relatively quote unquote normal lives, right? They had they portrayed them as having normal jobs and normal problems and you know what we would consider stereotypically normal things. So I have this what we would kind of identify as positive representation. They had kids, they had they had a life, they had a family. That so like you would see with other families on television, that this kind of quote unquote normal representation. Now there's some. You know, argument to be made that is this really positive representation is it accurate and is it accurate for the the majority of that population but the truth is just like every other aspect of society gay families are diverse and in who they are and what they are and how they behave and all of those types of things are just as true for gay families as they are for anybody else so was this a, some people would say this is an attempt to normalize homosexuality and make it more palatable to uh, a broader audience, and that's not necessarily good for representation in the uh, homosexual community, the gay community, LGBTQ community. So, I mean, there are arguments all over the place. Again, this is not just a binary thing. There's lots of gray in here. It's not black or white. It's There's lots of gray. Uh, so we also need to consider the idea of what we call invisibility. Right. Are these things really visible? Are they are they shuffled off to the back or represented in some way? So are they are they portrayed in a way that makes it acceptable or makes it not really as as seeable or or skews that perspective in some way um, through some um, types of things like using camp? what we would call camp. Camp is just a stylistic element that, that resonates with the experiences of queer individuals living in a heteronormative social system, right? And it's kind of a bigger than li larger than life representation of what that experience is like. So we think of uh, like, we think of like Jack from Will and Grace, that's sort of a camp representation, what we would call a camp representation. It's out there. It's big. Is it really, again, is it really representative for that? But I, you know, I don't know, but so it's, it's almost more like a parody of what it's like for gay people to be living in a heteronormative social system. And this is what it feels like. It feels like they have to be this otherworldly thing and like they're almost an alien. Like Jack was really um, out of this world with some stuff. Right. So is it a real representation? I don't know. Um, so the other thing we, that, that we look at with invisibility is you know, kind of the fourth persona or that what, what's called the textual wink, which is kind of, you know, sneaking things in there. Are they or aren't they? And it's, you know, we slip things in like uh, think about Harry Potter and this question of whether or not Dumbledore was gay. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe there were there were some signs in there that maybe. And so that's kind of a textual wink, but without really being so in your face about it. Camp is really in your face to an extreme. Right. The textual wink is kind of a more subtle thing. You know, um, 
one game that became very, very popular during the pandemic and that has been pretty popular in my house is Animal Crossing, right? If you've played this Animal Crossing New Horizons, uh, it's a very, very popular game on Switch, and, and there's a lot of great features about it. There's some questions there, though. I've, I've seen, uh, heard talk or, or there was a big debate about whether two of the characters, um, uh, CJ and uh, I can't remember the name of the the bug guy all of a sudden. I'm sorry, I didn't write that. I should have written that down. But the fishing guy is CJ. And the, uh, there's some been some discussion about whether or not they're a couple. Whether or not they are, they are in fact gay, and they are a couple, uh, based on some things that that come up in the game and things. But again, it's, it's so subtle, it's so hard to tell. Even if we, there's really a clear definition as to whether or not that even is the case, or if they're just cartoons in a game. Who knows? But there are some people who believe that that's sort of a textual wink that they slipped in these things that represent, uh, you know, uh, gay. Um, people lgbtq folks living in this world of animal crossing and uh that that they are in fact a, a couple that these two are in fact a couple so um anyway to, whether or not that's true i don't know but that's what we mean by that that textual wink is it being you know hidden in there somewhere and kind of kind of like you know parents hide your vegetable hide the vegetables sometimes right you crush up those vegetables and, and put them in there so the kids don't even know they're eating them right are we getting that in our media uh, re regarding the LGBTQ community through that textual wink? So uh, those are some contemporary perspectives, some things we need to think about and consider as we're, as we're going through these things. Okay, so what are some common questions that come up as far as queer analysis? Uh, first, how is sexuality defined in the artifact? Is it Does the artifact define sexuality as very binary, very, you know, masculine and feminine, and that's it, or, you know, uh, or monogamous and promiscuous and that's it, or, you know, the natural and deviant, the, kind of the, the angel of the devil type of perspective in terms of sexuality. Uh, a woman is either um, uh, 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 Mary or the whore, right? Either she's, she's whatever, she, she is saint or she a whore, and that's, those are the only two possibilities, right? So how is it defined in the artifact? How, how is sexuality represented overall in this artifact? Uh, what are the power relationships between persons of varying sexuality? So maybe there is rep representation of LGBTQ, but they're in the background. They have no power. They're, you know, and they're, so they're living in a very hetero world and they just happen to be in there for maybe representation, kind of token representation. Uh, but what are the power relationships between the persons of varying sexuality as they're represented in this artifact? What does the work contribute to our knowledge of queer, gay, lesbian experiences and history um, and including their artistic history? So how does this inform us about the history of people from in the LGBTQ community and the, and the reality of their world? How does the artifact illustrate the problematics of sexuality and sexual identity? Right? So how does it uh, represent those things? And does it uh, gloss things over? In some ways, again, go back to that modern family art argument that some people would say, well, that just... It just makes it way too simple and tries to kind of gloss over things. Yes, they're a gay couple, but it's way too um, heteronormative in a sense in terms of how they behave and the problems that they face. And so it doesn't really illustrate the the challenges that some um, LGBTQ people and couples face in, a, in our modern society. So is it represented fairly in, in this artifact and, and accurately? Uh, what sort of support, if any, is given to the elements or characters who question the heterosexual homosexual binary and what happens to those elements or those characters? So if, again, someone does question uh, the, the, uh, the, the appropriateness of that binary, somebody who comes in and says, look, this is, this is not enough. There's a, there's a broader spectrum. How is that element or that person treated then within that? Uh, within that artifact. And then what elements of the artifact exist in the middle? So between the perceived heterosexual, homosexual binary, in other words, what elements exhibits traits of both? So is there any crossover? How is How do those things exist? And what is represented in the middle there? What is, you know, treated like it's in the middle? So Okay, so as I usually do in these, I want to give you just a brief example of, of applying this, um, uh, this perspective to an artifact. So this may be a little surprising where we're coming from. In my house, it is not um, uncommon. If you were to walk in and see what's on the TV, if it's not on a news channel or something like that, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to be on the Hallmark channel. Uh, my wife is a full-blown 
Hallmark addict. And especially when it comes to, of course, the countdown to Christmas and the, the, the Christmas movies that they have. And they do lots of holidays and theme type movies. And things. She loves those. And I understand why. They're not my favorite, but we'll watch them because I'm a good husband and I like to watch things with my wife. And watching things she likes to watch every once in a while. And she indulges me by watching things where, you know, things are getting blown up and people are being chased in a high speed auto you know, chase, right? But so, so we were watching this uh, movie the other day and it really struck me and it's fairly new as of this recording, fairly recent movie on the Hallmark movie. And, and it's a pretty, I will tell you, it's a pretty standard Hallmark type of movie, right? It's called Notes of Autumn. And so in Notes of Autumn, you have these two friends who uh, are, are, you know, kind of stuck in a rut in their life. And so they decide that they're going to swap houses for a while. Right, to shake things up a little bit. They're going to trade houses and uh, and just to get into a different environment, try and shake things up, shake their lives up and, and see what they can do. Now, which is pretty, all pretty Hallmark. And the rest of the, you know, the, the movie really is pretty Hallmark. Of course, they run into lots of misunderstandings and, and mishaps and all kinds of shenanigans, right, as you do. And then in the end, there's, there's love to be found all over the place in Hallmark movies. So, of course, the people that they meet, they don't like at first, and then they end up liking them, and all the all the typical Hallmark stuff is in there. Uh, but the difference in Notes of Autumn that I that I saw, and it wasn't really like in your face, but the difference in Notes of Autumn is that the couples uh, include um, a, a man and a woman. So the, the two friends are a man and a woman, right? And then they end up coupling up. The woman meets a man, as you would you know, normally find in a Hallmark movie, but the other couple ends up being two men. So it turns out the, the 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 one of the friends then is gay, and ends up meeting another friend. So Leo is the gay um, friend, and uh, and ends up meeting uh, a, another guy named Matt, right, and falling in love. And so this is you know a fairly recent thing I think for Hallmark to be featuring gay couples in you know or, or representing characteristics of of gay couples in their movies in their in their original uh, material. So. Let's take a look at Notes of Autumn then and lay over some of those questions from queer analysis on this movie. So, uh, again, best friends Leo and Ellie decide to swap um, homes. And then after after lots of shenanigans, they come to uh, uh, to, to, to find love, of course, in a Hallmark movie. But uh, so how is sexuality defined in the artifact? Well, as I mentioned, of the two friends, Ellie and Leo, Leo is gay and uh, and, and then ends up. Um, <clears throat> coupling up with or uh, finding love with Matt. So sexuality is defined in the artifact as at least we know heterosexual and homosexual. Now it does not expand much beyond that, uh, but uh, but it does expand just beyond masculine and feminine and into those different types of sexuality. So uh, which for Hallmark again was a pretty big stretch, I think it's pretty big uh, for them. So it is defined at least expands the world into those areas and has that kind of representation. Now, Within that, there's not a lot of, I mean, even within the couples, there's a lot of, like, there's a masculine and there's a feminine side, which is kind of what creates that the friction within the couples. I guess it's it's almost necessary for the the movie in some ways, for a Hallmark movie to have that kind of friction. But, you know, within that, yeah, there's a lot of pretty stereotypical masculine and feminine traits within the couples, within the different partners in the couples. It just happens to be that one of those couples is is gay. So what are the power relationships between the persons of the varying sexuality? In this particular production, it happens to be fairly, I think, fairly equal. Power is represented fairly equally. They don't portray the the the, um, the gay couple as having, or the or the uh, the gay men as having less power, or um, uh, you know whatever. Then uh, they, they don't portray them really any differently than they would. I don't think any other character. And I've seen a lot of Hallmark movies. They seem to be pretty typical for for how they represent. Uh, individuals so they didn't seem to do that very much so there wasn't any issue with and i think part of that though is probably you know it is a big leap for hallmark to have representation of gay couples in their movies to begin with i mean that was a huge deal a couple of years ago i had stars leave the channel and go to a different channel because of that and advertisers left and things because of because of a commercial that aired right but now they have them in a representation in uh, their movies and I think that's a big enough leap for them that they said, look, we don't really want to push too hard on some of this stuff. We don't want to really draw attention to the plight of a gay couple. So it is kind of it kind of glosses over that kind of thing. Like there are, there are really no challenges that these men face because they're gay. 
the challenges that they face are because of other things that's again the standard hallmark type of issues and, and misunderstandings that aren't really related to their sexuality so so it's not surprising i guess that their the power relationships wouldn't be that different because they don't want to really draw attention to those things and make it even more controversial by bringing that issue that kind of social issue into it what does the work contribute to our knowledge of queer gay or lesbian experience in history i mean not much in that sense really because it kind of glosses over that and just just portrays them as a couple as they would any other hallmark couple right um, so both couples are really really portrayed in much the same way so it doesn't really end to our understanding of you know what it means to be queer or gay or lesbian or uh, you know anywhere on the, on the in, in the world of the LGBTQ um, uh, experience it doesn't doesn't really address that because it really just portrays them as you know the couple which again is in some ways positive I mean I don't want to I don't want to downplay the idea that it's positive there are people watching this that that may really, really disapprove of homosexuality, but maybe this introduces them to it. Maybe, you know, just it takes that first step for them, but it doesn't really add a lot of depth to our understanding of, of the history or, uh, or or the experience of being gay in the contemporary United States, in my estimation. How does the artifact uh, illustrate the problematics of sexuality and sexual identity? Again, it doesn't really. In fact, it kind of goes the opposite direction and and intentionally avoids anything uh, apart from the fact that these are two men in the relationship. So they're, they're you know, adding a, a homosexual relationship. They, apart from that, it doesn't really illustrate any kind of problematics that may be related to that. I can, for reasons I've already discussed. So, um, so it doesn't really, it fairly is fairly intentional about not doing so about not really delving into that kind of, uh, kind of thing. So, uh, so it doesn't really address those things and, and, uh, illustrate any of those problematics. So it doesn't really give us a very real idea of what it, uh, of the added complications that folks may face in our contemporary society for being involved in uh, a homosexual relationship. What sort of support, if any, is given to the elements or characters who question the heterosexual homosexual binary? You know, this isn't really a good example for this either, because uh, what happens is because nobody does it. It's almost as though they, they live in a world where this is just a totally unquestioned type of relationship and completely accepted by everybody in their society, in that community. And uh, so there's really... Uh, no support that's given to anybody who questions that because nobody questions it. So, you know, I don't really know what, what else to say about that in the, in particular, in this artifact in particular, uh, because they do, uh, they make it made a very intentional choice about not representing that aspect of the relationship. So what elements of the artifact exist in the middle between the perceived, uh, heterosexual, homosexual binary and what elements exhibit traits of both? Again, not, a, not a lot because they, they really represented this as a fairly heteronormative relationship that just happened to involve two men. Um, so there weren't a lot of artifacts that existed in the middle. Uh, there weren't a lot of stereotypes that were, that were portrayed apart from the, the traditional, you know, masculine, feminine type of stereotypes. They're really just dipping their feet into this, you know, dipping their toes into the water with this whole idea of even having representation in their their movies. So um, there aren't a lot of artifacts in the middle apart from the fact that it is a, a relationship that that involves two men. Uh, so um, so I guess that's something that's that's progress in terms of queer analysis. That's progress for a Hallmark movie, but but still there's a lot of uh, a lot of way to go for them to be really considered you know, representative in that, in that way. So anyway, so that's my, uh, uh, that's my analysis of notes of autumn, the Hallmark movie, uh, notes of autumn, as far as laying the framework of queer analysis, uh, over that artifact. I hope this gives you a little bit better idea of queer analysis and what it means and, and how it's used, how it's applied, uh, and at least expand your understanding a little bit as to what we're looking at with queer analysis. If you have questions about queer analysis or any other type of critical media study or critical uh, analysis uh, perspective, critical lens, I hope that you'll uh, shoot me an email and let me know. And, uh, and otherwise, I hope this really just opens your eyes to some things. We can start to see things and, again, add this lens as another tool in our tool belt for the purpose of 
analyze media in a critical way. 